everyone, you're listening to Sacred and Profane Love, a podcast in which philosophers, theologians, and literary critics discuss how literature can help us think more deeply about love, happiness, and meaning in human life. I am your host, Jennifer Frey. I am an associate professor of philosophy at the University of South Carolina. You can follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter at Jen Frey, and I'm on Instagram at Professor S. Frey. You can also follow the podcast on Twitter. Our handle is at Eudaimonia Pod. In this episode, I speak with the writer Michael Farmer about the philosopher and playwright Gabrielle Marcel and about Michael's new translation of his play, Thirst. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Sacred and Profane Love, a philosophy and literature podcast hosted by me, Jennifer Frey. This evening, I'm really delighted to be joined by Michael Farmer. Michael is one third of the Christian Humanist podcast. He is also the author of Imagination and Idealism and John Updike's Fiction, and his essays have appeared in The Crescent, Christ and Pop Culture, and Touchstone. Welcome to the podcast, Michael. Thanks, Jen. I'm so excited to be on. I've been listening to your show for several years now. A little intimidated. Oh, 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 no, don't be intimidated. Come on. Besides, in this episode in particular, I am really leaning in on your expertise because we are going to be talking about Gabriel Marcel, who was a French philosopher and a playwright and a musician, I believe. Yeah. And I honestly don't know that much about him. I've read one of his books that I like very much. So you have a new translation of Thirst or Eager Hearts, and it's with Clooney. Mm -hmm. So is that the is that the first in a series of translations you plan to do? I, I hope so. I have I have the other plays translated, and I've, I've sent one into Clooney, and I'm waiting to hear back from them. Um, he said I'd hear okay. back by the end of the summer, so hopefully hopefully we'll know soon. But uh, yeah, I would I would love to translate to have all of them published, just because again, you know, if the rest of my life I spend beating down doors for Gabriel Marcel, I feel like I'll spend my life okay. So how many plays are we talking about here? Oh, there's more than 20. Um, I haven't okay. translated all of them, but I've translated a number of them. And I, I did a bunch of them before I sent anything in, um, just so I could make sure to send one that people might enjoy, because they are um, kind of dry French plays, if that makes sense. <laughs> it does. It yeah. does. I find it difficult to read plays. I prefer to see them performed. Yeah. Well, and that's um, what I really hope will happen. I really hope somebody will put on this play. And I think I have the performance rights to the English edition. So I'll tell you, if anybody wants to put it on, I won't charge it much. Of course, maybe that's not yeah, my call well, to make. Maybe maybe well, Clooney makes that decision. Yeah, I think they do. But but <laughs> if any like you Dallas kids or Thomas Aquinas kids are listening, uh, you, you should come on. You, you should do this play. It's out there now. So I want to hear more about Marcel because he seems like a very fascinating figure, not just because he was so vastly influential for so many philosophers in the 20th century, but also he was more than a philosopher. He's also a playwright and apparently a musician, and he converts to Catholicism. Late in I life. I think, yeah, late in life. So I just, yeah, tell us about Marcel. Yeah, so he was born in 1889 in Paris, and I believe his father was a diplomat. Henri Marcel was a diplomat to Sweden, and so Marcel spends a lot of time in his childhood away from France. And he, this is this is where he says he develops his love for music, which is uh, which is really important to him. He says somewhere that he doesn't really have a homeland. What he has instead is music, mm -hmm. um, which is someone I've been thinking about that line lately, because I, as someone who grew up in kind of a faceless suburb, I wonder if my home is also in some sense music, that, that that's the kind of specific locale that my imagination grew up in. But that's not really the topic of the conversation here, is it? His mother dies when he's very young. Um, I think he's three or four years old, and he's raised by his father and his aunt. And this was this was obviously a traumatic event for him. And he would struggle with this his whole life. And he, he struggled also with being an only child. And he says that's where his drama comes from, is that when he was a kid, he would, number one, just kind of listen to the adults around him have these conversations. And most of his plays are conversations between adults. And also, right. I, I, mm -hmm. I think having no... Um, no other children in his family. He had to kind of project these other personalities, and that's where the plays come from. 
Yeah. So is he a philosopher first or a playwright first? Well, chronologically, he's just... a playwright first. He, okay. he, I mean, I think he publishes some sketches, but he publishes plays about 10 years before a new book length philosophy comes out. And, you know, you might, you might know his first, well, you said you only read um, Homo, how do you pronounce it? I would say Homo Viator. Oh, I say Homo Viator. But Which you know, you're probably right. Um, I never, I never took Latin, but so, so uh, he, he has a book called the Metaphysical Journal that is, you know, literally just a journal where he's kind of rustling through pro uh, problems in metaphysics. And mm -hmm. that comes out in the late twenties, but he's got uh, two plays that come out in the late teens um, that I, I think have recently been published in translation by St. Augustine Press. I haven't read those translations, but mm -hmm. they're called uh, Grace and the Sandcastle. And mm -hmm. what's interesting, and, and he says this too, is that a lot of times in his plays, he seems to be hitting on ideas that he comes to in his philosophy years later. So right. his, his plays are not, he's really adamant that they're not illustrations of his philosophy. And in fact, it seems like in some ways, the philosophy might be illustrations of the plays. If, mm -hmm. uh, if that, it's, it, the philosophy is like attempt to work out these problems that have arisen subconsciously or artistically, however you want to think about how, um, how playwriting works. Yeah. And w one of the things that happens, I think, is that those two, first two plays are about really intense religious themes. You know, he's 10 years away from, at that point from his conversion. But if you know it's coming, you can really see it in those first two plays. He ends up converting in, I think it's 1927 or 28. Francois Mauriac is his sponsor into the Catholic Church. But he's quite late in life. He's 38 or 39. Mm -hmm. And he was raised almost entirely without religion in the kind of great French bourgeois tradition. Yeah, so it's kind of, it's midlife, right? Maybe it's his midlife crisis. Well, like Chesterton, right? Chesterton was about that age too. And uh, and yeah. John Henry Newman. And me, I should point out, I, I converted when I was 38 as well. Um, and I, okay. I, can't, I can't help but feel that Marcel had something to do with that out there in the afterlife. Yeah, so how much of his philosophy did he write pre-conversion? Most of the stuff that people still read is post-conversion, I would say. So like Homo Viator is late 30s. And, you know, part of the thing is he didn't write a whole lot of books. He mostly wrote essays and journals that he kind of configured. Right. The great majority of it is is post-conversion. His, his, his big books, Being and Having, Creative Fidelity, Homo Viator, and Mystery of Being are all post-conversion. Being and Having, right. I think he wrote parts of before his conversion, and you can see it happening mm -hmm. in that book. But yeah, most of, most of the stuff he's known for is post-conversion. Okay. Yeah. Well, Homo Viator seems very Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very so, important book, I think. Yeah, it's great. Um, I mean, look, it's the only Marcel that I've read, but I I really love it. Yeah, it definitely makes me want to read more. But I'm a finite being. I just right. need to I need <laughs> to get back to teaching existentialism, and I would definitely throw Marcel in this time. While we're talking about that, he did famously coin that term. Um, existentialism. I think he used to have these discussion groups on Friday afternoons, in Paris, and all sorts of people would come. And I think that's where he coined the term existentialism, referring to Sartre. That's interesting. Do you know who he studied with? I mean, was he studying philosophy? Yeah, Bergson, I think, was his teacher. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I've not read Bergson, so I can't really speak to that. I mean, I have, but it was a long time ago, but it makes sense. I mean, there is a kind of phenomenological bent to all of this. Yeah. And I think maybe the way that I want to tackle this is to start with the play, since that's where Marcel himself started <laughs> as a playwright. And I do think that you see the seeds of some of his philosophical ideas in his plays. And then we can talk about some of his philosophy. I think the essay that we chose was The Mystery of the Family, right? which is one of the essays that makes up the collection titled Homo Viator, A Metaphysics of Hope. So let's start with the play, Thirst or Eager Hearts. Why did you choose this play? Where is this play situated in the trajectory of the 20 plays that he wrote? Yeah, I sort of want to hear more about the play. Yeah, it's right about in the middle. So it's 1938, which is a, a period that the late 30s are, are a period of really incredible productivity for him, right? So he, at the time he's writing this, he's writing, I believe some of the essays that are in Creative Fidelity are, are written that late. 
And certainly most of the essays in Homo Viator are being written around that time. But he's also writing that at the time he's writing Thirst, he's writing another play called, oh, I think it's called Column Beer or The Torch of Peace, which is a comedy, a really nasty satire of pacifist organizations. Like it's, it's mm -hmm. funny, but it's, I mean, it's, it's really, really mean for him. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, because Thirst doesn't, isn't really all that mean at all, but uh, Column Beer is, is really a kind of nasty play. And he's writing it at a time when the whole world is falling apart, right? So he's sitting, I think, helplessly in France and Switzerland, and he's watching he's watching what feels inevitable. And obviously, it turned out to be inevitable. What, what ended up happening, happen. And you see that in Thirst, even though he writes in his autobiography that when he was writing it, he, he felt overwhelmingly happy most of the time he didn't when he was writing he didn't feel that that kind of anxiety even though i think the anxiety pervades that play from top to mm -hmm. bottom mm -hmm. is there a reason why you chose thirst as the first play that you wanted to translate yeah i thought um he has a lot of plays that have heavy political themes uh just because of the time period he writes most of them right and i mm -hmm. i thought um, I thought maybe we'd all had enough of politics for a little while. Yeah. I thought that the characters in Thirst, although they're a little formalized and, and maybe in my translation, they're a little stilted. I thought they felt very, very human and relatable in their way. And in, in particular, I have, I have, since I read the play, I've always felt a little bit like Amade, this, this guy who's, you know, obsessed with his own success and failure and paranoid that everybody's out to get him and completely unbearable to the people who love him. Um, I, I think I, I, I saw something of myself in that. And so I uh, maybe that maybe that's maybe that's why I picked this uh, this play. Yeah. So let's talk about the play itself. So it's basically, you know, it's not very plot driven. I mean, some things happen, you know, that are important, but it is one of those plays that's really just a lot of different conversations that kind of, you know, each conversation reveals something more about the persons involved in the drama, but it's principally members of a family, mm -hmm. the Chartrand family. Amade is the father. And then you have Arnaud and Stella, who are the two children. And then there's Evelyn, who is their stepmother. Is that yes. correct? Yes, she's, she's Amade's second wife. His first wife has died in an insane asylum. Yeah, so there's this specter haunting the whole play, which is his dead first wife. And honestly, it seems to me that the whole drama is kind of driven by concern for her daughter, mm -hmm. that her daughter is going to fall prey to the maternal heredity, you know, this sickness, you know, that they're all where it sort of like hangs over her like the sword of Damocles or something. And so everyone seems very keen on saving Stella somehow, saving Stella from this maternal heredity. Or from her own her own panic over her maternal heredity, right? Because at, at certain points in the play, it seems not so much that there's actually a threat as Stella has become neurotic over the thought of the threat. Yeah. So she, I mean, yeah, so she's part of it too. You know, she's, she's worried that she's going to end up like her mother. I mean, what's the backstory there? What do we actually know? Or what do we come to know as the play unfolds about what happened with the mother? I mean, she was institutionalized. Right. And, and I think Stella has spent the intervening, is it two years or three? You think I would know, but I don't, whatever, whatever number of years it is since her mother's death, she spent that time blaming her father and kind of turning him into the villain in the story that he drove her crazy. He didn't love her. And, you know, that was the reason she died in this insane asylum. And what, what becomes revealed about halfway through the play is that, Oh no, in fact, Amade was really a victim in this situation. The mother tried to kill him and that's why she was institutionalized and that's why she died. So Stella's whole framework for seeing the universe her father is the villain, her mother is the victim, gets completely reversed. So on, on, on top of everything she's worried about in terms of her own future, you know, her, her whole worldview, if you like that word, is, um, is turned upside down. That's right. The mother tried to poison the father, I think. And who can blame her? I mean. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but I mean, it's interesting because I actually wondered reading this, obviously we never hear from the mother, she's dead. And is it so clear that the father's word is trustworthy? No, that's that's a that's a good point. It's it's never confirmed by anybody outside um, outside the family that that's what happened. Yeah, so that 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 was sort of unclear to me. I mean, the mother is this very mysterious spectral presence throughout the whole thing, and it's like everybody is kind of trying to piece together whatever they can about her, um, but it's not like we're given all that much information and the people that give us information, you know, have various motives right. and need to protect themselves. And so I, th I think it's just this very unclear, I mean, that, that was sort of the impression I took away from it is we don't actually really know what was no, going I, on I, with I, mom. I, I think that's accurate, but at the very least her conception of her mother's been cast into doubt. That's right. Yeah. And I think, you know, she is, she's, she's someone who is haunting the daughter. She's haunting the second marriage. I sort of feel like she deserves to be in the cast of characters <laughs> uh, because it's like she's driving the whole thing. It's so funny you should mention that. I hadn't considered this. This is why actually talking about stuff is good instead of just doing it all in your head. He has a play, one of his early plays is called The Iconoclast. And it's about a real guy he met who his wife died and he felt very strongly that his wife had appeared to him during a seance and told him to marry this other woman. Mm -hmm. And the, the play is all about him coming to doubt that that's what happened. And and there too, uh -huh. you have this, you have this dead woman haunting the whole show, even though she never actually appears. It's like she, she kind of lingers on in the actions of all these other characters. Right. Yeah. So we have, so we have this family and I mean, what, I mean, if you had to summarize the plot, which would be very basic, what would you say? Well, you really have a, a series of plots, right? So you, um, and, and they're all very bound up in who the characters are and what the characters are worried about. So you have Amade who has been forced out of some position he's held and he feels like everybody's out to get him. He feels like he's a failure. Uh, the one that strikes with me is he has to cancel his magazine subscriptions because he doesn't have the money to pay for them. And this is a big deal for yes, him. Yes, the, like, the art reviews. Right, because right, he was a pompous blowhard, right? And he, he thinks of himself as being at the center of of culture, even though it's clear he's not. He doesn't seem to produce anything. He's he, uh, Yeah. Then you have his mother, who I, I think is the play's really comic figure. Um, she is She's a Nazi sympathizer, kind of old bourgeois French woman who mm -hmm. the, the play opens with her essentially going through the newspaper and deciding which poor people deserve support and which ones don't. That's right. <laughs> yeah. She seems to be something of a eugenicist. Yes. Like, and there are all these scenes where, you know, she's sort of like, someone will be like, oh, you know, Hitler, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, well, he's not wrong. He's just misunderstood. <laughs> if the French really got to know him. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little creepy. So, yes. so you have her and then you have the, the two children, Stella, um, who, you know, I think is a very sympathetic character. She's very sensitive, very emotive. And, and this is the thing that happens to her that we've been talking about. She finds this thing out about her mother. Uh, you have Arnaud, who is another character, I won't say stock character, but a character who gets repeated in a lot of Marcel plays, that he's someone who wants to join a monastery. There's often mm -hmm. there's often somebody about to enter religious orders or who has entered religious orders in Marcel's plays. And one of the interesting things about Arnaud is people criticize him throughout the play. They call him a jerk. They call him unemotionally involved. They say his God is just like, like him and he's not, um, he doesn't bother helping anybody. And they're not wrong, right? I mean, they, M Marcel is Dostoevsky in enough, if you want to put it that way, to let the other side have, have their say and not to, not to discount it. So we're not a hundred percent sure if Arno wants to enter religious orders because he's called to a vocation or just because he wants to escape the world, right? Because he he has some sort of relationship with um, this girl Maggie, and it's not clear as to whether he's just terrified of sex or whether he really feels called to the monastery. And I, I right. think that I think that tension is open. Right. The the fourth member is uh, Evelyn, who is as you said the second wife, and 
as the play progresses, it becomes clearer and clearer that um, this marriage is not working, that it's falling apart, and that Evelyn's not sure what to do with it. So I think she's also very sympathetic. I mean, all the characters are very sympathetic, except maybe Amade and, and Madame Chartrain. And even Amade, you're supposed to, by the end, I think, feel sympathy for him. Right. And one of the points of deep tension in the marriage is over Stella, right? Right. Because Aveline is very insistent that Stella not marry this young man, Elaine. Elaine? Elaine, yeah. Alan, however you want to pronounce it. Yeah, we would say Alan, but it's Frenchy, so we say Elaine. <laughs> and so, right, so she's she's also, hasn't she received a proposal of marriage Yes. So uh, Elaine has proposed to her, but there again, it's kind of like Arnaud. We're not sure whether he really loves her or whether he is just terrified of death and sees this as a way of kind of prolonging death because he, more than any other character in the play, feels World War II coming. And he, mm -hmm. he knows that because of his age, he is going to go to World War II when it, when it happens. And he is, you know, but quite likely, or at least it's quite possible that he's going to die in World War II. And so... Yeah, his... yeah he's a bit like a sheep being led to slaughter. Mm -hmm. Right. And and I, I think there, Marcel is probably, um, probably dealing with the anxiety he felt about his own son, who was draftable age uh, around this time. And, and his son did go to, uh, to World War II, although he came back uh, mm -hmm. alive. So, I mean... But I, I think I think a lot of the fear that Elaine feels is fear that Marcel must have felt for his son, his only son. That's right. And so, Eveline, she feels like Elaine is a dud. Yes, which she kind of is. That it's a very bad match for Stella. Stella seems convinced that Elaine is kind of her salvation, or her her only hope, and so she is super annoyed that. Eveline is like butting in. And then I kind of feel like Amade is just kind of caught in the middle of it. Well, and there's also the implication that Amade has been in love with Elaine's mother since they were children. They've, they've certainly been close friends and it, the play is certainly set up to make you think that he's in love with her. I don't know that he actually is, but he's always talking about his very dear friend, Madame Pugerlan, or however you pronounce that, Pugerlan. Right, right. And so maybe that's... Um, a suppressed motivation for right. his second wife to be very much against this. But also, I mean, if Evelyn's got a point, right? Because Stella absolutely should not be making a decision to marry this guy at a time when she's so incredibly emotional, emotionally fragile, because she has refused the proposal before. But now that she's starting to, now that she has become convinced that she's going to go crazy like her mother, she decides to accept it. It's like she's given up on life. And so she's going to marry Elaine. Right. And so this, you know, there's just a lot of, there's just a lot of conversations about yes. this stuff. And it's a talky um, play. It is. It's very talky. Um, so, you know, what's the, what's the resolution? I mean, what would you say is like the climax of this play or its resolution or where, I mean, where is it all heading really in the end? Well, that's the thing, right? Marcel's plays don't tend to have neat resolutions. I, I forget which critic it is. It might've been uh, the, the critic Hilda Lazaron who said that Marcel's plays often end with like a, a ray of light coming through the window rather than with mm -hmm. any kind of resolution. It's like, there's a promise that somewhere down the line, something is going to make sense, but we're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. What'd you get at the end of, um, and are we spoiling the play? Like, I, I'm not sure this play can be spoiled. It's not terribly. Plot I, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, yeah, this isn't like, yes, we can talk about the ending. So, I, I mean, I would say the climax comes when, um, when Amade saves Elaine, right? Elaine tries to kill himself while Amade is out for a walk, and Elaine makes a big, or uh, Amade makes a big show of pulling him out of water and bringing him home, and he's insufferable about that. The way he's insufferable about everything. But then there's this scene at the end where Stella, who has been upstairs for what seems like days, right? Like she she hasn't been able to even leave her room. She comes down, and they're all sitting in the living room together, and there's this there's this scene where Arnaud talks about, not about Stella, who, who you think has been the emotional center of the play the whole time. He talks about Amade and he says, a little more time 
and all these phrases that he's so enchanted with will be lost in the silence. This affectation that he's fooled by will fall from him. He'll be there alone, disarmed, defenseless, like a child who has been struck by sleep and who still holds his toy against himself. In the face of the living creature who pontificates and gesticulates, Evelyn, if we only knew how to evoke the recumbent man of tomorrow. And then it says, they look at each other. Evelyn is vanquished by tears. She leans over and kisses Amade on the forehead as if perhaps one day later on. Like, that's your that's your resolution. It's like, one day, this man's family is going to learn to see him as the kind of broken child of God that he is. Uh, mm-hmm. But they're not quite there yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's this very interesting line. This is page 177. So it's Eveline and Arno speaking to one another. This is Arno. You need your pain to be verified, Eveline. There are other types of pain, just as there exists illnesses that aren't recognized, and they're no less awful. For my part, I think that Papa is an extremely unhappy man, much unhappier because he communicates less with his pain. The kind of indistinct thirst that devours him, he himself doesn't know it just because it's devoured him. And obviously the the play is called Thirst. I mean, what what is this indistinct thirst that devours him? Like what diagnosis is Arnaud trying to articulate here with respect to his father? Well, I mean, if you, it, it reminds me of that famous line from The Sickness Unto Death, Kierkegaard's Sickness Unto Death. And, and Marcel didn't read Kierkegaard till he was late in his career, but he did read him and said, hey, wait a second, this guy's work sounds a lot like mine. But anyway, there's the, there's the line in The Sickness Unto Death where he says the, the specific character of despair is exactly this. It's, it's failure to recognize itself as despair. And so, right. yeah, Amade, Amade has this problem that he thinks he has, this external problem, right, which is that he he's being persecuted by the other people in his profession. And, and, you know, we have no idea whether that's actually happening or not. But what he he's so fixated on that and he's so fixated on all these other externals that he doesn't notice this like gaping hole in the center of his being. You know, he can't he can't see what he's actually lacking. And I don't know how to put that something in words, but I think that's what Arnaud is talking about. Well, I mean, do you think that it's supposed to be, it's kind of like, it's sort of Augustinian, right? The thing that Mm -hmm. we're all thirsting for is God, whether we realize it or not. I mean, is that kind of the gesture that he's making? Yeah, I I think you could, especially given that it's Arnaud who's saying it, I think you could go there. Marcel is so... um, resistant to theologizing, like even in his philosophy, I don't remember if he does this in Homo Viator or not, but he does this in a lot of his books. He just repeatedly declaims, I am not a theologian. I'm not a theologian. And and his plays, I mean, he doesn't want to preach uh, any kind of faith at all, even though, I mean, as far as I can tell, he was a very devout man. Um, I, I think he's he's just trying to present. So it makes sense that Arnaud would think that. I, I don't know if the play ends up affirming that that's exactly what his problem is. Um, but it, I think it's certainly readable that way. I mean, it's play, so it's not theology. But just to mention God or even to gesture towards a yearning for God isn't to do theology. Right. That's true. That's Surely. true. I would hope not. <laughs> I think certainly as Catholic readers, we can look at that and say, oh, yeah. I mean, that's what um, – Amade has this very comfortable bourgeois life. He's raised by his mother, right? And we got, we, we can't forget that, that the – that Amade was raised by this woman who sympathizes with Hitler and is always reading, um, what's the guy's name? The Life of Jesus, the the, the French agnostic author Renard. I, it's a it's a it's a nineteenth century uh, text that's in the kind of Voltairean tradition. She she's talking about it. Uh, Strauss, mm-hmm. David Strauss, right? Mm-hmm. And anyway, that's the background he's coming from. I don't know that it ever would have even occurred to him that that God would uh, would be something he would be missing. But it doesn't have to occur to you in order for it to be true right. that God is the thing that you're missing, you know, famously. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right, because it turns out that everything that you're really after in life is just a false idol of the thing that will actually, right, fulfill your thirst or slake your thirst or satisfy right 
But I mean, look, the play has to be called Thirst for a reason. Right. Yeah, it's privileging that scene. You know, it's got to have some meaning. It's not It's not just like a throwaway line. Right. So the question of like, what? what is it that we're really thirsting for isn't, I mean, it's just an existential question. Now, it might be taken up by a theologian, and you might do some theology in answering it, but it's an existential question. Right. And at that level, and of course, then you could write some philosophy about it as well, which obviously Marcel does. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but this is neither philosophy nor theology, but it's still we have a character who is addressing a human experience. And if the play is called Thirst, right, then I think we're meant to reflect on what it could possibly be a thirst for or where it's leading us. And possibly, you know, to what extent the same problem is manifested in the other characters. Right, right. I mean, what's, what's interesting is Amade, who has words for everything, right? He never shuts up. He has this very grandiloquent language. I, I worried about translating him because I was afraid people would think I didn't speak English very well because he's so, like, he just he just drones on and on and on. You see why I identify with him. But he... um. He has his words for everything, but he doesn't have words for this. He barely even seems to recognize that he's on a quest. He doesn't seem to realize he's thirsty. He thinks he's got it, but he doesn't, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's also this incredibly interesting conversation between Arnaud and Madame de... How do we... Madame de Puigalan? <laughs> Puigalan, I don't know. Puigalan. Madame P, that's what we decided we, we would call her. Between Arno and Madame P. So this is, let me see where this is. This is scene eight in act three, I think. Yeah, scene eight, act three. And she's talking about her relationship with his father. And then she talks about suffering and sort of suffering and, and what it means to deal with the past that's been very heavy and very full of suffering. Um, and she says, I've even told priests about it, only they didn't understand. They didn't want to. It's as if human suffering didn't have the right to go past certain limits. When it goes beyond them, it develops the same consequences as a serious fault. It's castigated. If I'd been easily consoled over the death of my husband, there would have been other interests in my life. I wouldn't have weighed so heavily on my poor Ellen. And then Arno, she and Arno are kind of talking about the suffering. And Arno's response is really interesting. He says, no, it's just that perhaps you're not going all the way there. This suffering you speak of, which goes beyond which, what nature admits, I imagine that it's not a fault, but a very heavy privilege, that it has to be accompanied by a certain renunciation. Otherwise, it's self-indulgence, illicit, destructive, not only for oneself, but especially for others. And then she says, profoundly. <laughs> or, <told. laughs> or deeply, to be that fair. Must be, yeah, that must be the truth. Thank you, Arno. I was kind of wondering about that scene, um, because she seems to... I mean, she, I don't know. It's almost like in that scene, Arno is, is given this space just to actually say something wise, um, which perhaps indicates that, you know, maybe his vocation is honest, mm -hmm. um, because of course it would, it's a very Christian conviction that he's articulating here about suffering. And I mean, he and has I the just, right to speak about renunciation too, right? I mean, more mm -hmm. than any of the other characters would. Yeah. And so I wondered like... Because there's a whole theme throughout the play about suffering, and I wondered how that was supposed to relate to this kind of existential thirst. It seems to me that the thirst we're talking about, again, is a kind of suffering that misunderstands itself, right? Like Amade, as I said, doesn't really know what the root of his problem is. He, he has no, no idea what's actually wrong with him. And then Madam P has some idea, right? Like she she can look at her son and recognize she she has these kind of um, psychological explanations that 
her son is so messed up because she was broken up at the son of the the death of his father and she didn't spend enough time with him on other things and so she kind of ruined him but then maybe arno sees this third dimension to um to suffering where where suffering can be kind of chosen and taken on and pushed towards some sort of higher purpose that gives it meaning mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah well i mean i think it's a good jumping off point for us to talk about how the play kind of picks up on some of the philosophical themes in his work. And the essay that we kind of chose to ground that conversation in is called The Mystery of the Family. Now, one thing that's really interesting to me about that essay, which covers a lot of ground. Yeah, it's, it's a big one. Is just the emphasis on the fact that we can't really understand what is good about the family on a completely imminent level that we have to understand it in light of an order that transcends it and gives it a deeper meaning and holiness. Mm -hmm. He's like, otherwise it just seems kind of random. Right, <laughs> like, right. You know, like you were just thrown into this group of people. Maybe they're awesome. Maybe they're totally nuts. Like, it's kind of the luck of the draw. Uh, not, not for nothing. That's kind of a, a Sartrean way of thinking about the family, right? That the family is just this kind of random collection of weirdos you're thrown into. And you um, you kind of create yourself by transcending that group of people, right? And, and coming into your own. Right. Well, I agree that it is just a random group of people you were thrown into. Like, that just seems like a fact, you know? Like, I'm sure... <laughs> Look, I love my family very much, but would I have chosen them of all the people in the world? Probably not. Well, I think what Marcel would say but, to that is there's no, like, that's a that's a incoherent criticism because you wouldn't be you if you weren't thrown into that group of weirdos, right? Like, that's right. Yeah. And it's not a criticism, right? So it turns out, right, that this is a feature and not a bug. Right, right. But to understand this, we cannot remain on the level of nature. I mean, that's sort of yeah. how I read what he's saying, that we have to understand it in light of something higher. Like we can't really understand fatherhood and sonship and, and like this sort of thing without the theological framework, right? Of what it means to have God as a father. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems to me that this picks up a larger theme in Marcel's philosophy, namely the insistence, well, maybe insistence is the wrong word, but um, he's always kind of pointing to the need for the transcendent. Yeah, he is. Why is that so important to him? Because I think for him, if you don't have transcendence, what you're going to get instead is just this kind of um, wallowing in eminence, you're, you're going to get you're going to get something that can't possibly rise above the banalities and injustices of everyday life. Um, what's is is, is is it Heidegger or Percy who who talks about average everydayness? That's Heidegger, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and Percy picks up on the idea, but it's it's Heidegger's uh, terminology. And I, I think either you get transcendence or you get just totally mired in average everydayness, which gets taken over by the forces of mass society on the one hand. So he has a, a really good book. I, this is this is one I would recommend to people who are just starting on, pers or on uh, Marcel. He has a book called uh, Man Against Mass Society that I, I think is really quite good. So you get the forces of mass society on the one hand, and on the other hand, you get scientific materialism and rationalism. And without transcendence, those are your two options. And neither one of them is enough to build any kind of human soul on. Right. And so how do you think that kind of relates back to the play? I mean, this this theme and the mystery of the family about the need for this kind of transcendent order to really understand family life. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's just that in the play, the 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 absence of any clear expression of that transcendence contributes to the the confusion and i mean it, it's not a surprise right that stella when she wants information about her mother calls a psychic we haven't really talked about mademoiselle fru who's another kind of comic figure but 
-hmm. Stella is grasping for some sort of transcendent order. She, she says early on that she envies Arno for his God, but can't believe in him. But she's, right. she's willing to put her fate in the hands of this very silly, ultimately psychic who, who the, the information she gives her about her mother is not due to any kind of psychic powers. It's just, you know, that she knew her mother and gives her some information that way. So I, I, I think um, part of the, part of the thirst that you see in the play from, from these characters is, is a thirst for the sort of eternal order that would allow them to find meaning in their own lives, as opposed to just kind of foundering, which is what they do. Right. That's right. Yeah. This is kind of a perennial theme. I mean, <clears throat> with humans, like right. when people who, you know, can't believe in God or they are just so alienated from organized religion or whatever. Um, and yet they like are into crystals or, you know, they, they reach for all of these new agey stuff. Um, my friend Tara Isabella Burton has this really kind of wonderful and funny book called Strange Rights, where she sort of looks at all of the replacements mm -hmm. right, that, that people her generation have looked to as, as replacements for religion. And I mean, most of them are just wacky. Right, right. <laughs> I, I do have to say this, though, which is that Marcel was very interested in psychic phenomena before his conversion and maintained some in interest in it afterwards. So even in The Mystery of Being, which is 1951, he's talking about how we need to do more research on telepathy because he, he thinks he thinks telepathy could be a real thing. So I, I, I don't I don't know that he's totally trying to point out the v vapidity of Mademoiselle Fru, although she is certainly vapid. So I, I'm not sure he's trying to tar all of um, all psychic phenomenon with that brush, but yeah, it's it's an it's an interesting tension in him to be sure. Well, I mean, a psychic phenomenon is a very loose, That's true. broad category. I mean, is demonic possession a psychic phenomenon? It seems like it, but then that gets taken up into a a Jewish Christian theological context of understanding. I don't know what to say about telepathy, but Thomas Aquinas believed in it, so there, there's there's some um, there's some theological backing. Well, part then of it's which... completely legitimate. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so next, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but um, yeah, actually, I don't know. Obviously, in the show notes, I'm going to put whatever. Uh, assume the question is on telepathy because I've never clearly I've never read it. I've, but, I've never um, read that either. I just heard Jimmy Aiken talk about it. So, but like, it's one thing to. I don't know, subscribe to the Theosophical Society newsletter and another thing to think that there's weird psychic phenomena right. out there. Right, and it, right? it's, it's but, hard to look at Mademoiselle Fru and say, oh, well, that's obviously what Marcel thinks we should be like. Right, yeah. Okay, so the other thing I kind of want to talk about briefly is that Marcel seems really insistent in this essay that we are very that we are a very kind of interdependent <laughs> sort of thing and he says really remarkable things like you know who i am to myself is really only something that i come to know through my interactions with other people like there is no self that is What's the word I want? There is no self that's like shorn free. Mm -hmm. Autonomous. Yeah, there is no autonomous self. Thank you. Because the self, insofar as I have any self-understanding, it's not principally because I've engaged in this kind of Cartesian reflection in which I, you know, become a weird kind of disembodied ego <laughs> <laughs> but actually through my interactions with other people who help reveal myself to myself, or I'm somehow always filtered through my interactions with other human beings. And the family is the most obvious starting point mm -hmm. for this, right? And I find that really interesting. I wondered if you could say more about how that's a theme generally for him and maybe how it gets taken up in his plays. How does he explore this in his plays. I, I think it's really important to see him in contrast with Sartre, whom he knew, and he is older than Sartre. And I don't think he was ever formally Sartre's teacher, but he certainly had a kind of mentor role 
in Sartre's life. Mm -hmm. And I mean, one anecdote that I, I sometimes tell people is that um, Simone Beauvoir's um, Ethics of Ambiguity was mm -hmm. written at Marcel's request. Um, so, mm -hmm. I mean, he, he really, he had a profound influence on that generation of atheistic existentialists, even though anything he writes about Sartre is always critical. Like he, he, he thinks Sartre is wrong about basically every important thing you can be wrong about. And in Homo Viator, there's an essay called Being in Nothingness, where he really lays in to, uh, to, to that book by Sartre. But so, mm -hmm. so you think about the section in Being in Nothingness, where he talks about um, being in the park and you look out and you're the center of the world. And then you see this other consciousness and it's a threat to you. Yeah. I think you can read Marcel as that in reverse, that you look out into the park and you see another consciousness and you think, oh, I'm here too. So instead of, right. instead of seeing other people as being this threat to your autonomy or threat to your self-conception or your dominance of the world or whatever, which is, I mean, when I read Sartre, that's how I read him. Um, Marcel is saying, well, actually, the only way you know you're even in the park is to have these other people looking at you. That's right. Or how do you even have the concept park to begin with? Right, right. <laughs> right. It's not exactly an innate idea. And in that sense, it's, it's very Heideggerian again, right? Like um, the, the uh, being in the world, right? It's, it's a Dasein. It's not, it's not a disembodied consciousness. It's a consciousness that's very embodied in a particular locale with particular other people. And that's, that's, that's Marcel as well. That's right. But for Marcel, it's like being in a broken world, right? Which like is his term, very... yeah. Yeah. And I wondered if, if we could, if we could kind of talk about that because he, I think it seems pretty fundamental for him that we find ourselves in a world that is broken. What does that really mean for him? It means, I think that it's, it's missing that kind of transcendent dimension that, that makes it work. So he has a play called The Broken World from 19, I think 36. So it's, it's post-conversion. And the, the title comes from the main character asking her husband, don't you feel like we live in a broken world? It's like a, a, a stopped watch. All the gears are still there, but nothing's turning. So you live in this world that has the semblance of meaning and the semblance of connection, but nothing quite fits together. It's missing some dimension that makes it tick. And what is what is that dimension? Well, I mean, the secular way to put it is being right. You're 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 missing a connection to what is deepest in the world because you're driven to shallowness by modern life or whatever. And I mean, that's the, that's the Heideggerian answer. And sometimes Marcel talks like Heidegger when he doesn't want to get too religious. But I think mm -hmm. um, you know, it's uh, if you're a, if you're a Christian and you're reading Heidegger, it's not too hard to substitute God. When he says being with a capital B, right, and and I so I, I do think that's that's something Marcel is getting at this this kind of transcendent dimension that you mentioned earlier, this connection to something really real, mm -hmm. as opposed to the kind of monumental nonsense of various flavors that we all live in. Yeah, and then the final thing I think for Marcel that seems worth mentioning is the importance for him of wonder. Yes. Wonder in particular at being itself and how that for him is connected really, you know, to hope and faith and the whole thing. I mean, and, and there is actually a line in Thirst where I think it's Evelyn, but I'm not sure, but one of the main characters talks about how she's lost her sense of wonder. Mm -hmm. And so I just wondered if we might end by talking about the place of wonder in his philosophy and why that's so important to him. I think that's the essential thing about the title, The Mystery of the Family, because Marcel makes this big distinction between mystery and problem. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Can we talk about that, actually? Yeah. So yeah. the best place to turn to that, if you he, he touches on it briefly at the beginning of The Mystery of the Family, but the best place to turn is an essay that in French is called like Position and Approaches, Position and Concrete Approaches to 
the ontological mystery, but in English they have wisely translated it just on the ontological mystery. Mm -hmm. and, and so the difference between a mystery and a problem is that a mystery intrudes on its own data, I think is the, the language he uses. So um, you can't solve a mystery objectively. And in fact, you can't solve a mystery at all because the person doing the solving is himself or herself deeply tied up in the mystery. So how on earth do you talk about the family? How can you treat that as a problem or even a series of problems when in fact you're embedded in it, right? This is back to the, back to the question you asked um, a few minutes ago. How, how did you come to be with these people? Well, I mean, literally you, right, came to be with these people because there's, the family is this great mystery that you're connected to in a way that you can't possibly disentangle yourself. And so almost everything important for Marcel is going to live in that realm of mystery rather than the realm of problem. I mean, problems are things that you can solve, like how do you make the train run on time or how do you increase right. the efficiency like, of the workers? Yeah, he seems to associate problems with like technical solutions yes. like right i have this is broken how can i fix it whereas he thinks of mystery as something completely outside the realm of techne or like know-how and something more i don't know more philosophical more perhaps theological i don't really know how marcel carves up the difference there mm -hmm. but something that you can't you'll never really exhaust for one thing, but then secondly, you just can't approach in a technical sort of way, right? Right, because it's it's not about means at all, right? And and the you couldn't approach it technically because using the technique would make you no longer part of the mystery you're trying to approach, right? Yeah. So, like, he even objects to the term "the problem of evil" because we're so involved in the problem of evil that it can't be treated as a problem. That's right. Yeah, no, it's like an existential condition. Right, right. <laughs> and so it has to be approached with wonder. And I think that's right. I think he Pretty talks true. about this in Homo Viator. I think that's right. I mean, I I am very often asked to give lectures on the problem of evil. And and I do. And, and I teach the problem of evil. But I'm always careful to distinguish between the problem of evil is like a logical problem or a philosophical problem about how certain propositions can be reconciled with one another, or like, how do we understand what it means for God to be omniscient and omnipotent and omnibenevolent, and also the fact that evil exists in the world. Okay, well, we have to understand what evil is, blah, blah, blah. We can come out on the other side of that recognizing that there is no contradiction there. But that does not touch the existential problem of evil. Right. It doesn't touch it. Now, maybe it, maybe it opens conceptual space for you that wasn't there before, because like maybe somehow you were wrongly convinced that there's just some kind of contradiction there. Okay, good. Philosophy can show you that there's not. But now you're left with the existential problem of evil, which is the problem of pain, the problem of suffering, the problem of the brokenness of the world, the problem of your own exile. I mean, like right. it's all there. Right. The problem of your own sin. Yeah, your own participation in evil. And that, I mean, this is something that uh, Flannery O'Connor talks about in some of her letters and in some of her. She was also a big Marcel fan. She read Mystery of Being. You know, I didn't know that. That's that's really interesting. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. No, I, I didn't know that, but it makes sense because she has this theme as well, you know, that there is a certain kind of mystery, right, of, of human suffering that um, we can enter into, uh, but that we will never exhaust, right? And it would be... I mean, it would be a kind of madness right. <laughs> to, to, to be like, oh, well, let me just write an essay just spelling that. <laughs> um, that's not that's not how that works. And like you should not – I mean, I know <sighs> philosophers are people who really and truly do not understand or appreciate the limits of philosophy and so end up being like the worst kind of cheerleaders for philosophy because the worst thing you can do for philosophy is like oversell it. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> like, 
Like, it's incredibly important. It probably saved my life, but let's not pretend that, like, let's not pretend that it's going to solve all your problems because it's definitely not. Yeah, I think she's really, I think she's really brilliant on this. And it, it just reminded me of her when I was reading it. So it makes sense if she, if she, if, she, if it's all coming from him. No, I think that's true. Christina Bieber Lake told me um, that, that, that O'Connor was a big Marcel fan. And I'll, I'll defer to Christina on, um, on that. Yeah. 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 Well, it's interesting. I mean, maybe a project for me at some point is to, uh, first of all, read a lot more Marcel, but then think about Marcel in relationship to Aquinas because... I can't think of anyone except in relation to Aquinas. Sure. Um, well, you might you might look at his relationship with Maritain. I know that they um, they had some tension between them. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah that's interesting. And I, I think part what, of the problem like, was that Maritain was too Thomist for Marcel. But I, I'm not I'm not a good enough philosopher to follow that argument very well. <laughs> I will say there's a passage in Marcel's autobiography that is so nasty to Raisa Maritain that I cannot believe they published it. Like, it's just so um, uncalled for. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, maybe it was personal. I think, yeah. I think it was. So I, 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 can't, I can't really I, – I don't understand Maritain well enough to tell you what Marcel's objection to his work was. Yeah, well, it could be. I mean, one, one thing that you definitely pick up when you read Marcel is that – He's very suspicious of, I don't know, too too much abstract thinking. Absolutely, yeah. And sort of like what, you know, really wants to defer to experience. And I mean, obviously the scholastics are, are pretty okay with abstract thinking. I myself am pretty okay with abstract thinking, although I do recognize that it's limits, which is one reason why I have a literature and philosophy podcast, because um, I do think that um, we need to go back and pay attention to human experience, but I think philosophy, I think philosophy hits at the general. That's what we do. So it may be that maybe I'm off the Marcel train there. I'm not really sure. But, like, I don't know what the philosopher is doing if he's not giving us general truths. So. Right. right. And it's not like Marcel's not making abstract statements, right? Yeah. The moment he stops writing plays and starts writing philosophy, he is performing some sort of abstraction, which I'm sure he, yeah, I'm sure he would to. admit. I mean, you can't think without abstraction. But I, 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 do think, I do think he's onto something when he says, essentially, you can't abstract the mystery. When you abstract a mystery, it becomes a problem. And when it becomes a problem, it ceases to be deeply important, the deepest level of importance. That's right. Um, we're going to just, in deference to time, we're going to have to wrap it up. So just to remind our listeners, we've been talking about Michael's translation of Thirst, which is now out by Clooney Media, which is a great press, by the way. And you should definitely check out their website, cloonymedia.com. And... We, I recommend Homo Viator. What do you recommend of Marcel that people read? Uh, Man Against Man Society, I think, is very good. And also, if you can get your hands on that little essay on the ontological mystery, I think that is the single best. It's 15 pages, and it expresses almost all the major currents of his thought. Um, so, so in English, there's a little volume from Citadel Press from like 1955 called The Philosophy of Existentialism, and it's got it in there. Terrific. Okay. And last question. If they're done with Thirst and they want to read another Marcel play, which one do you recommend after that? The next one I've sent into Clooney is called The Stinger or The Sting, Ladard. And it's it's a more um, political play, except it's, it's to the degree his plays are defenses of anything. It's a defense of the idea that art does not have to be political, which I felt like was a pretty important message in 2021. Right. So hopefully, hopefully Clooney will be interested in that one. If they're not, it's probably because I didn't translate it very well. <laughs> oh, come on, stop. Stop. All right, thank you, Michael. This was very fun. Thank you. This was a blast. You have been listening to Sacred and Profane Love, a philosophy and theology podcast that is generously underwritten by the Institute of Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America and produced by Catholics for Hire, a group of young Catholic digital content freelancers. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider supporting us on Patreon. You can go to www.patreon.com slash eudaimoniapod 
to become a monthly patron for as little as $2 a month. And I'd like to take the time to acknowledge our most recent patrons for their monthly support. So thanks goes out to Elizabeth Brink, Sovan Mood, Lord Wingate, Helen Dooley, and Aaron Ward. For our next episode, I'll be joined by Professor Fritz Bauerschmidt to discuss Graham Greene's The Heart of the Matter with a little help from our friend, Thomas Aquinas. Until then, be well and keep reading.